evening let's post what we're doing how you doing everybody Whew. days of flying hello hello hi to you all we are doing our second week of our midweek menopause madness thank you for joining hi <laughs> manuela gorgeous lady um thank you for joining guys and girls and guys and girls um yeah so it's week two of our menopause madness um catch up with uh, Dr. Menopause Care, the gorgeous Naomi Potter is joining us again. Um, thank you so much for all your questions that came through on both of our um, Instagram pages. We will try to get through as many as we can today. It might not happen because there were so many, but we are discussing perimenopause, menopause, symptoms, treatment, and um, yeah, what the hell is going on. So I know that Naomi has requested, so I'm gonna get her on now. Get this chat started. There she is. Hello, good Hello. evening, honey. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, thank you. All good. All good. Lovely to see your gorgeous smiling face again. <laughs> yes. You too. You too. I can't believe a week's passed already. It's crazy. So um, here we are again talking the menopause, the perimenopause, the madness that is my brain at the moment. Um, <laughs> So obviously we've got a lot of questions. We can't go through everything. We'll have to probably do another one next week and maybe we just do it regularly because there's so many questions that are coming in all the time and there's so many different situations and variables because it's a very individual journey as we've spoken about before. Um, so I thought maybe we could just kind of, some of the questions that you came through were, and I think a lot of people are really confused about when do I know that it is happening to me? That's the, yeah, it's the tricky one. Um, it's, I think if you're so if you're sim if you're developing symptoms and you and you can't identify where they're coming from, that's often quite a good clue that it's um, that it's perimenopause or menopause. Um, I think, like we said last week, like you can have this the the array of symptoms is so wide um, that really menopause can manifest as anything. But if things are new and they are, you know, impinging or impacting on your on your life, then that's the point that you could think, actually, one minute, maybe this is what's going on. Maybe if you wanted to get some sort of help, then you could. Yeah. I mean, we touched on it yet last week. I just think I'll quickly it's like reiterate and kind of like go over the some of the sorts of those symptoms that are flagged for me and for most people straight away. So obviously things like fatigue, anxiety, your cycle changing, um, weight gain. Um, anger rage acne <laughs> hot flushes but can i just say cold flushes too so yes. like for me i and i spoke to you about it this week which was just so crazy so you do have these hot flushes or flashes as i think they're called you have night sweats but then in the night you're left shivering like it's unbelievable it's like these like pins and needles all over your body with like pinpricks so mm -hmm. um there's all those sort of things hair loss there's there's a there's like a multitude of different issues that uh, yes hair loss somebody said about hair loss on there um you know so those are the sort of telltale signs i'd say the traditional signs that you would be like okay something's going on um and age isn't always a factor and then the other question was um when does it end that's a biggie <laughs> so when you don't you don't go through the menopause you go into the menopause that's the that's that's the kind that's the that's the thing really um you, you it's not like you go from one through something to the other side there it is it is indefinite you are indefinitely estrogen deficient unless it's replaced and it's just your body often just gets used to being estrogen deficient <laughs> okay so there isn't so i often get asked that as a question like, when do i know i'm through it when do i know i'm when do i know i'm kind of post well it doesn't really matter um, you know, you're, you're postmenopausal officially a year after your last period, but really, yes. it, it doesn't it doesn't really matter unless you're thinking about contraception. That's when. So if you if you need to know when you're officially postmenopausal, when um, you can think about stopping contraception. But really, that's the only. And still, it's arbitrary. Still, it's just somebody's decided. It's yes. not, um 
yeah, it's not so fixed or so important, really. But I mean, a friend of mine her, who shall remain nameless uh, didn't have a period for a year, just assumed that's it, I'm, I'm in to the menopause. And then she got her period out of the blue. So it's not always as simple as like, right, I haven't had a period, that's it, no more periods for me. It's always very... Yes, but if you individual. go for a year without a period and then you have a bleed, it should be investigated as postmenopausal bleeding. Oh, that's really important to know. Okay, okay. Yeah, please tell your friend. <laughs> I will, I absolutely will. Straight after we finish this live, I will be talking to her about it. Um, some people are asking about, you know, we talked about it last week, the sensitivity, your skin changes, like products that you would normally have been used to using. It, you have a reaction sugar alcohol all these things that we spoke about all of a sudden you can't have a glass of wine or i can't have a glass of wine or that bottle of wine because i just turned into an absolute demon from another planet yes. and then the hangovers are just some, beyond. Just, some women get um, allergies to food so it's particularly particular like fruits um soft fruits uh, that can that can happen um like it, it's yeah it's um it's so different, isn't it? It's so different in everybody. Okay, so something that I've learned this week, which I was really ignorant about, and I just really wanted to highlight for everybody, was that there are three camps when seeking treatment. Now, I always thought there were just two. I always thought it was just um, go to your GP, um, from my experience, not get the help that you want. So then you just throw some money at it and you go private. And that's what I have been doing for the last few years. I didn't realize that there was another camp, which is your GP or a more empathetic GP, somebody who would, you know, potentially somebody like you, who's, who's got a lot more knowledge, a lot more um, understanding. Um, and so there's three different ways you can do the treatment. So the NHS would, uh, so the first camp would be go to the NHS, get your HRT patches, things like that, hopefully if they would help you. The second camp, which is what I did, was I went, and correct me if I'm wrong, Naomi, because I'm still <laughs> learning all of this, went and got my private doctor to prescribe me the hormones that he thought I needed. And they were bio-identical hormones. So this yeah. is cream that's made in a lab that's effectively synthetic that will try and mimic what your body is lacking. Um, well, they say that they're natural, um, but oh. what, you, what you don't know, so, it, so that, that's why they're called bioidenticals, because they are based on, um, uh, firstly, they're derived from natural ingredients, but secondly, they are supposed to um, be the same chemical structure as your own hormones. And that's why they rose to popularity when they did, because it was after the big studies that demonized HRT, and they came up with this um, solution, really, which was to provide you with a natural way of giving you HRT. Um, so that's the bio-identical, or sometimes called compounded bio-identical hormone therapy. Because bio-identical does sound like, oh, it's just so like, it's just mimicking what you're lacking. You know, yes, it just sounds, it yes. does sound so natural, doesn't it? Like, I'm just going to bounce out of here and I'm going to be 20 again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but the complicated thing is that the body identical, so really it's saying the same thing, is the same as regulated bio-identicals. And the, uh, the body identicals that you can get from your GP if you ask, you know, if your GP knows what they're doing or you've asked for it, um, they are also based on naturally um, derived. They're also naturally derived, I mean, but they're processed in a factory that is regulated. So that's the difference, is the that's regulation. The so it's the British Menopause Society and the body are all regulated. The body yes. hormones are all regulated yeah. um, and the bio-identical, which... I've been telling you, are not uh, approved by the British Medical, British Menopause. Menopause Society. Yeah. So, you know, I feel like I've learned something huge this week and I wanted you guys and girls to have that information because hopefully there's some guys listening too because you could get this, in, you know, this will help your ladies in your life. Um, but I had no idea. I honestly had no idea. I didn't Google the British Medical Society. I just got word of mouth from a friend. Oh, I went to see this doctor. You know, if you, t if you Google menopause doctors, all these names come up. And, you know, if you live in London, that's where most of the doctors, I think, probably are I don't know, a base, those sort of menopause doctors. Um, and I just got it from word of mouth. So I didn't do my research. So one thing I have learned is always, obviously to always do your research. And hopefully these chats that we're doing, Naomi, will help um, to, you know, encourage yeah. people to go down the right route. Because now 
I have since changed my hormone plan and I'm going for the body identical um, through right. you. <laughs> that is all made in a, made in a lab that's been yes. approved by the British Menopause Society. Okay, so I'm lucky enough that I can do that. Let's talk about the risks um, in like, because I know a lot of, a lot of people and for a lot, for many, many years, HRT had such a bad reputation and it, it was, we were told not to take it if you've got any history of breast cancer or, you know, so let's discuss the risks, the pros and cons. Lisa, can you just give me one second? Sorry. Yeah. Boys, can you get the gates? Oh, I love this. There's always like a... <laughs> So I'm still learning about all of this. It's like, like I said last week, a minefield of information. I'm so sorry. It's all right. If you've got the pizza, is the pizza arriving? We've got like some takeaway arriving. <laughs> Dinner's here, kids. Go and fend for yourselves. <laughs> oh God, you give them one job, one job. <laughs> anyway, sorted. I do apologize. You were talking Definitely. about the risks. Yeah, just because it's had such a bad reputation, everybody's been so scared. I'm not taking HRT. It was like, the, you know, it was, it was sort of drummed into us that we shouldn't take it. It was like the devil's drug and we were all going to die. Yeah, yeah. So about in about 2002, there were a couple of big studies that came out that really um, changed everybody's view of HRT. It had been a bit of a wonder drug. And then these came out and it just, it frightened the life out of everybody. It frightened the life out of doctors and out of patients and everybody was either taken off them or pretty much stopped taking HRT. Um, but what the, the reason that those, that they were big, big studies and, and very kind of well recognized and thought to be very good at the time. But when we look back at them, we realized just how flawed they were. So they looked at, you know, women that were, that were much older, they looked at um, using uh, old fashioned medication and um, at high doses. And so what they, what they found is not representative of what we use nowadays in the body identical especially um, in the doses that we use and the population group so the women that we use them on tend to be in their 40s and 50s rather than 60s and 70s um, and the most recent data actually shows that hrt especially the um, hrt that you use the estrogen through the skin is much much safer Okay. So it's, it's much safer in the sense that it is not thought to increase the risk of clots um, or heart disease or strokes. Um, and the breast cancer risk that they thought was much higher is actually not. So if you use HRT in women under the age of 50, there is not thought to be any increased risk of breast cancer. And if you use it in women over the age of 50, the risk of breast cancer probably is increased, um, but only marginally. And you're no more likely to die from breast cancer. Okay. Plus, there's a whole load of benefits from being on it. So it's now it, kind of modern, modern data shows it to be really very safe. But the problem is that the um, headlines from when, you know, from 2002 are still very firmly kind of planted in everybody's memories. And it's so hard to get rid of it. It's in, really deeply entrenched. It really is. It really is. You know, you, I mean, people are really shocked when you tell them like, it's like, it really is a, you know, polarized opinion. People are very nervous about it. Okay. So, so personally, from my experience, I would recommend um, if you are going through any of these things personally, obviously research it properly, look at your doctor, you know, we, like we said last week, you know, go to your GP and take somebody with you um, so that you can get the answers that you want because if you are going through any of these awful situations you're not in your right state of mind a lot of the time you get flushed you get flustered you get anxious you get nervous you get all of the above and so then when you're in a doctor's appointment and you're a bit like rushed out of there and you haven't got the answers that you wanted that's why you recommended last week to take somebody with you yeah. um and they can be your cheerleader as it were you know back you up tell the doctor that this isn't acceptable and that you need some either blood tests or help in that area if you do want to go down a different route then i would recommend obviously googling the british menopause society and getting a private doctor somebody like naomi um who can help you and get on the body identical hormones not the bioidentical hormones um but that's totally your call as well totally your call it's you know if you just it's it's just you know i guess it's ethically how you want to do it right just picking up on something you said there about bloods. Did we talk about bloods last week? We we did talk. No, we didn't. Did, did we talk about? No, we didn't. We didn't talk about bloods. No, we need to talk about bloods because you said that you can you can almost um, 
pretty much get a good indication um, of somebody's lifestyle cycle and, you know, from their menopause or perimenopause journey just from having a consultation with them rather than the bloods. But the bloods are very important, aren't they? <laughs> so in w women over the age of 45 that's what i'm trying to say women over the age of 45 if their cycle is slightly changed i'm trying to be like a good student and i'm totally messed it up haven't i sorry over to you yeah. over to you <laughs> women women over the age of 45 don't need blood tests to diagnose the perimenopause and menopause that was it yeah that was what i was trying to say <laughs> If you are suspicious that something else is going on, then of course, do, you know, you do blood tests. But most of the time, you know, if you've got anxiety, um, brain fog, periods changing, those kind of things, it is the very menopause. Um, it, it really is. And you, would, you can start treatment without doing bloods because the danger is that you do bloods in women over the age of 45 and they're normal and then they don't get started on treatment when treatment is what they need. Under the age of 45, yes, we do do bloods. Um, and again, we do them because the perimenopause diagnosis is less likely because just simply by their age. And mm -hmm. we do want to make sure that there's nothing else going on. Um, but if you have normal bloods and you are still symptomatic and nothing else can be blamed for those symptoms, then you can st normal blood shouldn't mean that you don't get treatment. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And that's sometimes where there's a problem when you go to your normal GP, because maybe he won't be able to, you know, they're doing that what's normal and the age yeah. is, yeah. So it's like, you, you might not, you're of in the range, but what is the range for your age? Yeah. So that's why you need to dig a little deeper. Yeah, um, it's the problem. So the, it'll come back within, so it won't even be marked as red for your doctors because the range is absolutely huge. And so they will see a set of results that are reported as normal by the lab. And because they're not used to interpreting perimenopause or menopause bloods they will just look at it see that it's normal and then tell the patient that they're normal um, and that they yes. don't need treatment and you're like I'm absolutely not normal I need help um so let's talk about um should we talk about the premature ovarian insufficiency and surgically induced menopause um like what what actually like what can you do in that situation because that obviously having a hysterectomy or anything like that um it, it, it well like having a, an operation as major as that will just push you straight into menopause won't it yeah so with a surgical menopause you have to have your ovaries taken out um so you have so you normally have your hysterectomy where you take the uterus out but you're also your ovaries that's what puts you into the menopause so some women have a hysterectomy but leave their ovaries yeah. then they won't then they won't be in a surgical menopause okay. um if you have your ovaries taken out you the body um reacts much more strongly to that loss of hormone as opposed to a kind of dwindling natural perimenopause so symptoms can tend to be much more severe like they can be really severe um and often women come away from their operations without much guidance as to well without anything really mm. they can sometimes come away with no hrt no discussion of hrt um and then they are kind of plunged into this um, estrogen deficient or and testosterone deficient state. And it can be, yeah, it can, it can be really awful. So it is really, really important for those women to get on HRT um, unless there is a really, really good reason why not immediately uh, to, prevent, to prevent that from happening. And then with the POI ladies, the most important thing with them is for it, is for it to be recognised, for it to be identified and treated. So young women, you say in their, in their 20s and 30s, they go to their GPs with hot flushes and their periods changing and nobody gets to the bottom of it because everybody thinks that they're too young for the menopause. And then they can go for years without treatment, which has a massive impact on their bones and their heart and their metabolic health. So it's, that is the most important thing for them is to be is to be identified, diagnosed, and treated. With again, they often need very they often need much higher um, doses than older women. They do much higher, yeah. And people are quite scared about giving them what they need, but they often need yeah much much higher doses. 
And if you have got a premature event, a variant, you just call it POI, right? That's the abbreviation. Can you still, are you still fertile if you get the right treatment early on, for example? There is thought to be about a 5% chance of a pregnancy. Um, and, you know, sometimes it, sometimes it happens. Um, most, of the most of the time it doesn't, unless you use donor eggs um, with okay. IVF. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, but if you don't want a pregnancy, then it is important to use contraception. So that is an important. I have seen a case of that, where um, where a woman with POI thought that she was no longer fertile and, and got pregnant on, you know, and that wasn't desired. Um, but uh, yes, but you can take HRT and still be trying for that miracle baby. So okay. HRT is still the treatment. Um, it doesn't mean that if you're trying for a baby, you shouldn't take HRT. Okay. All right. So let's, let's talk about the um, instances where you can't take HRT. So for example, um, if you've had breast cancer, because I know that this is a big topic that came in. Um, a lot of you asked about this. Um, and I, I, I'm really interested in this as well. Breast cancer makes things tricky, uh, especially with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, because a lot of the treatments for that are a blocking of estrogen. So it's basically kind of removing all estrogen from the body and blocking and blocking its effects. So it doesn't make any sense to give HRT because the whole point of the breast cancer treatment is to remove estrogen. And so that's when it is really hard, because as well as having breast cancer and as well as having menopausal symptoms your menopausal symptoms can be made worse by the breast cancer treatments so i think women with hit with breast cancer or with history of breast cancer often feel a bit like the forgotten group especially on places social media where there's a lot of very pro hrt um, chat and i think they often feel a bit like well what can i do and there's so many you know there's there's there's, there's you know, hundreds of thousands of them as well. So it's um, it is a it's a really challenging area. But um, how you go about there are there are treatments available, and how you go about treating them tends to be more symptom specific. So um, if you've got say mood changes, then you can use antidepressants. If you've got hot flushes, there are particular medications that you can use for that. Um, you can use things like CBT, acupuncture. So there are things that can be done, but it is not as it is uh, not as satisfactory as using as using HRT. Um, the other thing to say is that a lot of women who say or think that they cannot have HRT, not a lot, sorry, this is the wrong choice of word. Some women who think that they can't have HRT um, actually can, and okay. you can sometimes you sometimes weigh up. Um, you know, you have a very open conversation. So say somebody's had breast cancer five years ago and they haven't had a recurrence and they are crippled with symptoms, you might have a conversation with them and their breast team. Um, but each, each case is looked at individually and, and ultimately it's a woman's decision what she, you know, what she would want to do. And are there any other, like, uh, contraindications or any other any other like a diet somebody said something about diabetes or is it heart disease any other issues or, or or hereditary you know family conditions that may uh be a factor in not taking hrt there's not very many so um other gynecological cancers so um endometrial cancer sometimes you shouldn't take hrt sometimes of ovarian cancer you shouldn't take hrt um but but not not as many as so the myth is that you can't take HRT if you've got high blood pressure if you've had migraines if you're very overweight if you're a smoker um, if you've had clots if you that's probably those are probably the big ones I think yeah. but in almost in all of those instances almost invariably you can take HRT um, you need with with the cardiovascular risk so the um heart disease and strokes and that um those kind of worries you want to give hrt to women in the perimenopause you wouldn't want to give um hrt to somebody with a cardiovascular risk if they haven't been on estrogen 10 years or 20 years down the line okay so, that's, so there is the too old issue um but often often women aren't even too old but that would be done again on a kind of risk you know you identify the risks for that individual 
that makes sense. I've been talking a long time now. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's amazing. It really is amazing. And I'm just, I'm just sort of looking over some of my notes because we obviously, like, between you and I, we spoke and there were so many questions that came in. And like I said, we'll probably have to tackle a lot of the questions next week. But we thought we'd just do an overall kind of, like, the symptoms. So if anybody's sort of, like, watching for the first time, the symptoms, when you know when it ends we've learned that it doesn't we don't it doesn't we go into the menopause um the risks of hrt which i thought was massively important because we've all got this this such a stigma involved you know surrounding it so um and then like you said i mean we'll get on to the treatment that i'm on which i don't know if is anybody interested in the treatment i'm on i don't know i mean it's i don't know i, I don't want to take up the time with that um but what was really interesting last week is that we had a couple of questions come in about um energy and should i have testosterone and i've put on weight and you said Naomi, which is very telling we are coming to the end hopefully of a global pandemic we've all been inside without seeing our friends and family we have to look at the factors of lifestyle rather than just blaming everything on the menopause which i think is really interesting um because you know i've put on weight i haven't been exercising as much Maybe I've been stacking a bit more. Um, there's grief. There's all these sorts of things that grief, for example, is such, you know, if anybody, I'm so sorry if anybody's lost anybody they love um, to this awful um, COVID-19. Uh, but it's it, it, something like that is um, massively disruptive on your body, on your hormones. And that can shut you down and, and, not, and you might not have a period. And then you might think that you're going through the menopause. But, you know, something like grief is, is, a, is something that would massively get everything off kilter wouldn't it yeah yeah um but if but you're absolutely right in the lifestyle when you are in lockdown our lockdown life is so different to normal you know normal life like if you think about rushing if you've got to catch a train in the morning rushing around the house because you're late getting all sweaty running to the tube station getting all sweaty standing up on a tube walking the other walking the other end to you know to work up and down in an office block all of those things, even though you don't feel like you're doing any exercise at all, you just completely eradicate. Um, it's, it's, you, it's amazing the difference that lockdown life has. And then all those, all those calories that you would have otherwise burnt. I bumped into a, fr um, a friend in a park the other day who's, um, who's a doctor who said that he was sat at his desk you know, all because he wasn't even getting up to go and let patients in like you would normally do and getting those steps in. Um, he just did away with his chair, he did 2,000 steps in his morning clinic by just literally being up and about. Um, and it just shows you what you can do, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I know when I look at my steps on my phone, I'm like, it's shocking what <laughs> the amount that I have went to. <laughs> when you look at the average of it, like, oh dear, 300 steps, that's not very much. In fairness, I didn't have my phone with me the whole time. Um, <laughs> But uh, let's think what else. So we've got COVID, we've got um, grief, but we've got... Somebody mentioned fibroids and um, endometriosis. And, they, and so those are two conditions that you need to be, have caution with when you use, um, when you use HRT, because they can sometimes worsen. But they are not a reason to not, um, to not use it. And that would be a case of having um, ultrasound and making sure that that's kept in yes. check, as it were. So ultrasounds, um, but and also, but also just kind of being being aware of symptoms. So if you suddenly had, if your bleeding was suddenly worse, or so you had suddenly had pelvic pain, or something that was like your endometriosis, that kind of thing, then mm -hmm. um, you know it's just, but it's, it's having an awareness and scanning as you know more frequently. Okay. Um... There are obviously other routes that you can go down if you don't want to take HRT, like you mentioned before, you know, there's, um, but, but, but also what you mentioned last week, it's like a healthy lifestyle. The things that we used to be able to get away with when we were younger, we can't really get away with it anymore. You know, we can't eat loads of crap. We can't drink loads of booze, um, biscuits and sugars and things. Not only are they bad for our waistline, but they just impact in our hormones just going crazy. Yes. Just, yeah. It's um yeah, it just it makes symptoms worse. Coffee, coffee. I know you're you're you like your coffee. <laughs> but um, I, I love my coffee. It's the I one thing I've got left. The one thing I'm not <laughs> drinking at the moment. Don't take my coffee away. I won't take your coffee away. <laughs> <laughs> but I know what you're saying because that just is that impact of like anxiety, and then you're like really anxious, and then you're sweating more, and then you're like I'm sweating, and then you're like panicking because you're sweating, and then it's just this sort of. <laughs> 
Yeah. Flustered. Or you need flustered. coffee to, you have coffee to wake up because you've slept so badly and then you have alcohol in the evening to sate yourself from the coffee that you had. And then and then you can't go to sleep and then you're feeling anxious and then you don't sleep properly and then you and then you have to wake up and then you have a call and it's all all goes. Yeah. <laughs> round and round the hamster wheel we yeah. go with no break, just a coffee break. <laughs> just to keep us going. And then a little bit of a biscuit in the afternoon too, because then of course once you've had so much coffee, your energy slumps and your energy goes yes. down and then you want to pick it up and it's this up, down, up, down fluctuation. And then yeah. your, you know, your blood sugar levels are spiked, and then you put it on even more weight, and it's just like, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a disaster. <laughs> it's menopause madness. <laughs> it's the midweek menopause madness, but it's not just midweek; it's all the bloody time. Um, but we're hopefully here to help, even though it didn't sound very helpful at all. Um, <laughs> somebody said about hot drinks. Say. I'm the same, hot drinks. I have a hot drink, and all of a sudden, like, I said to George, oh, "Is it hot in here? Have you got the heating on?" And I. <laughs> Do you turn that bloody heating on again? Because he's got access to the Hive app. So he's always like turning on the heating secretly. Yeah. I'm sitting right by the radio and I'm like, is this a flush or is this heating? Is it the flush? <laughs> so it's, um, it's a guessing game. But um, yeah. so there are other things I was just going to say. So obviously exercise, making sure what you eat is, um, is not too, yeah, too much sugar and carbs and things like that. The coffee, but things like um, vitamin B12 and vitamin D, um, as a supplement, I don't know how much you're allowed to sort of promote supplements. Um, <laughs> <It's>, I mean, <laughs> I can. I take them all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> supplements. Supplements definitely have their place, especially if you are not getting a lot of sunshine. So vitamin D, absolutely. Um, <laughs> and um and a, a good multivitamin is you know i don't think you can go wrong with that um and and then it it just depends on what works for you really a lot of women swear by magnesium if it works then why not you know you're not you're not going to do any harm um the the times that i worry about supplements is when literally women come rattling with all of their gazillion different things that they're taking some of which can be very expensive with very little evidence that that it that it makes any difference, and so, um, and so that's when I would have more reservation. But okay. things work for you, and yes. then then absolutely okay. Because um, yeah, because I, I I I think vitamin D is a necessity, de yeah. most definitely. Vitamin B, I'd say, um, if you're not getting enough um, dairy, then I guess because I don't take dairy. Calcium. calcium i do yes. like magnesium before bed i find that it helps to relax me um again it, it, and muscle recovery as well but that's i guess no scientific evidence but it works for me um there's a couple of other things like sage i've taken sage before and i have really noticed that that does really help with um flushes so right. sage that you can get sage tea and you can get sage tablets now i don't know if it was placebo effect i have no idea but it seemed to work it seemed to calm them down um but to be honest does it, it doesn't really matter because the placebo effect is very very powerful okay so it doesn't matter if your hot flushes have gone because you've drunk that tea it doesn't matter what mechanism does it really no it really doesn't it doesn't i mean they, they were when i was having the tea i was very hot but then after i drank the tea i cooled down um <laughs> <laughs> it's really not it's like i don't need to drink i'm really like loopy as hell um this little thing I've tried before, this lady care magnet thing, I have to say, I didn't get a very, enough, hence I've, yes, I've gone for the drugs rather than the, the lady care magnet. Um, but again, some people, like you said, it's the intention, it's that sort of, you've done it, so it sort of almost takes your mind off of it and you sort of think, oh, I've got that under control. Um, but if anybody wants this, I can send it to you to try. I don't know how hygienic that is, but you can have it. It's been down my pants. That's where you've got to put it. <laughs> Not really low down, just a little bit, just on my knickers, but on, yeah. Um, and then there's things like ashwagandha and shatafri. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I know if anybody else has offered to share their, their magnets, but very generous. <laughs> I will give it a surgical wipe down, I promise. I've got lots of like antibacterial in the house knocking about. I'm sure we all have. Um, but there's things like that that, you know, that <laughs> I've lost my dream. <laughs> there's herbal supplements and plastic devices with magnets attached to them that are out there for you to try. There's one knocking about for sure. <laughs> um, and then I guess. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry, I did. I just threw that one out there. Um, what do you do? You think that we should talk about? Oh, somebody said flaxseed. I don't know. I mean, I think that if you just like have a really like the amigas, I quite like the amigas and the evening yes. primrose and things like that. Yes. They are supposed to be really good as well. Um, and, um, and starflower oil with um, I've got the giggles now with GLA for breast tenderness. That can I've seen that really work. G L um, what is it G L G L A okay yeah gamma linoleic acid okay that's good so to that's, do that's um, good to do yeah star flower oil uh, because one thing actually and I don't know if this is a symptom that anybody else has but I I get into bed I've got my routine I've got my pillow spray I've got my like CBD like roll on the pulse point thing I've got my magnesium I'm chilled I put my phone in another room. I'm doing all the rituals you're supposed to do. And then I kind of get into sleep. I fall asleep. And as I'm falling asleep, I get this almost like a panic attack. Like, and I feel like my heart just goes, it's like, I just go zoom, back out of it. And then I'm wide awake. Is that the menopause? Could yeah. that be the pain? What is that? It's, I think it, it's probably an adrenaline surge. And then you get a hot flush as a result of it, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's terrifying because it's almost like, you know, when you, or you're having a dream and you you're fall off a cliff, it's that kind of like, yes, palpitation, somebody just said. You just all of a sudden, you just feel like, yeah, oh, so I have a heart attack. Um, that's so that, is, that is definitely, um, that's a classic symptom. That's a scary but one. But it should you know? go, it should go, it should go once you get your oestrogen levels up. See, that's the thing. So let's go back to my treatment and what I was initially... Um, prescribed with my bio identical and I'm not going to name names or you know I, I'm not in the market for bad mouthing anybody every doctor has a different way of treating um this I guess and a different you know and I and also bloods for me a blood test on a Monday on the 18th of February will be very different to a blood test that you will have done on the 30th of February because as a woman our 28 day cycle we all know how much it went up and down so much like the first week you'd be fine second week you'd be fine third week you'd be like a devil and then you'd like feel even worse and then you get your period so it's going like that all the time so i think it's quite hard to get a proper yeah. reading for one blood test in one month yeah it is so so on the monday i might have loads of estrogen and loads of testosterone and no progesterone and, it, and it's like that so i think that unless you do blood tests every day or at least once a week it's really hard to gauge so i guess when you have given us um an idea of what you suggest us to be on what medication it's trial and error it's like upping the doses or taking something away or adding something it is it is so much it's so much trial and error and you use bloods to guide you but um it's a, especially in the perimenopause it's a moving target because your ovaries can go quiet for a bit and then you can be very symptomatic um, and then you can you know, you take HRT or whatever and, and, and feel a bit better and all your um, ovaries might kick in and then you might feel like you've suddenly got a bit too much. And it's just, it's, it, is a, it really is a moving target, but it does tend to settle down. Okay. Well, listen, I'm still getting the flushes. I'm still getting the palpitations. I'm still getting the night sweats, not as often. Um, but you have recommended that I go up with my estrogen because hot flushes and night sweats are a really good indicator that you haven't got enough estrogen on board. It's not like, so other symptoms can be a bit more, a bit more vague. So say somebody's had anxiety throughout their life um, and then they, you treat them and their hot flushes and the night sweats go, but their anxiety continues. You might think, well, is that, is that perimenopause or is that something else? You know, where are we? Whereas with things, hot flushes and night sweats really do tell us that you haven't got enough estrogen. Okay, that's good, because I would really like those to go. I would really like those embarrassing flushes throughout the day when they just come out of nowhere and you're talking to somebody, somebody you don't know, and all of a sudden you are just pouring with sweat and they're looking at you like, are you okay? And you can't be acting like that, not in these, yeah. this day and age. You just really can't, you know? Nobody can. Yeah. They think that you're very poorly and you're like, no, no, honestly, it's just the menopause. And you're like, just the menopause, everything's drenched now. Um, so I'm excited for that to happen. Um, there's a, there was a couple of questions while I remember, and I've never done the patches, but some people, um, I was going to say her name, but I probably shouldn't, um, are having a problem with them sticking for longer than, um, how long do they stay on for? Five days, six days? Um, half a week. Half, Half a week. week. So, so I think it was between two and three days they start unsticking. So, is there is there a tip? Obviously, not put it on cream, put it on dry skin, or that sort of thing. But is there any other little 
nuggets of um the it does tend some women just do tend to have skin that it doesn't stick to and you can't really if, you, if it's something that's on you all the time you can't really change your lifestyle because you're going to do your sport you're going to do you know you're going to get in the bath you're going to um yeah you're going to do that do all those things there are some um some small brands that tend to roll up a bit less because basically there's less you know less surface area so you could try a different brand if the brand that you're using is not sticking as well maybe ask for a different one or a smaller one um the adhesives vary slightly so that's worth trying otherwise it will be a question of switching to a different body method identical kind of yeah trans yeah. product because I've got from you now, I've got a spray and I've got a cream coming, right? So I'm yes. excited. Tomorrow my new cream arrives. So this was the old cream. This is the bio-identical in this very plain what's inside it kind of jar. We don't know. We think it's what we think, what we're told it is, but we don't actually know because it's not been regulated by the British Menopause Society. So I was just taking um progesterone progesterone cream with testosterone mixed together um not a very high dosage i don't think and then i was taking my estrogen separately twice a day for this once a day for this and then every two weeks <laughs> on and off these and it's getting very confusing so i'm like right well, it's wednesday so is it two wednesday okay so this is the second week so then i stop these and then i start these and then i do this and then i do that you know, it is a little bit confusing, but so far it hasn't completely nipped my flushes in the bud. So I'm excited to try my new medication. Yeah, I which think is I'm, it should should sort should hopefully sort you out. <laughs> yeah, I know where to come if it doesn't. <laughs> I know where to find you. <laughs> um, yes, I can't even go on holiday. You can't. <laughs> You really can't. You can't escape. You can't leave the country. Um, what else do we want to talk about? Well, any, uh, mm, I mean, I guess we will get on. So anybody on thyroxin? What's thyroxin? Thyroxin is for um, if, you have, if you're hypothyroid. So okay. kind of, if, if you have thyroid problems um, and your thyroid's not pumping out as much of a hormone as it should, you take a, you take a hormone called thyroxin. And it can... So um, it's... If you take thyroxine and take HRT, each of them can slightly impact on how much you need of the other. So sometimes you need a, a bit of tweaking um, of, of both your thyroxine and your HRT if you start on one whilst you're on the other. But they are perfectly compatible. They're both naturally, you know, natural hormones that you and you need both of them. So, okay, amazing. Estradermal patches. I don't know why. I was supposed to put a question mark next to it um nicola i'm gonna post naomi's details because she's asked about booking an appointment with you so i will do that testosterone how important is it for brain fog and energy it's kind of important it's it is very it can be very useful um if so in the, in the... <laughs> very di very diplomatic there it can be very useful <laughs> in helping you get out of bed in the morning <laughs> <laughs> In the, it's in the perimenopause, testosterone also decreases. And um, if you, uh, you, we normally do bloods to confirm that level uh, before prescribing, before prescribing. Um, and it can help very much with libido. Not every, it, it's not won't always help with libido because libido has like a number of different um, factors that influence it. It's not just testosterone, but it can really help. But it can also help with things like power, joie de vivre, um, oomph, get up and go, mood, um, metabolism. So it it can be very useful, but it's not been around very much, and that's that's one of the problems with it because. Um, there was a product that used to be available on the NHS um, for women, but it was cut for commercial reasons. So um, really, there was only male products available that aren't licensed for women until re and recently there's a there's a new product that's available, but it's only available privately. Um, OK, not massively helpful to most women in this country. OK, yeah, because that's um, another thing. It's the price is a big, big factor in all of this. The price when I go when you buy the bioidentical. Yeah, ridiculously expensive. expensive like stupidly expensive which this product that's actually registered that's, that's approved by the british menopause society is 10 pounds 
isn't it? Ten pounds on the end. Is that is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so some of them are the so the the gel a uh, uh, bottle of Easter gel is a, a, about ten pounds. I mean, if you pay a prescription charge, that's all you'll pay anyway. Yeah. Um, but if you get them privately, they're not they're not massively expensive. Okay. And testosterone is more expensive, but it is it is only because it is on you know it's private. Um, okay. That's that's eighty pounds for a tube. Okay. And do you think that they'll change? Do you think that the more women that actually need testosterone, that they, I mean, I guess if there's a need for it, if there's, if there's more research and uh, do you think that then that will become available and there will be a women's, I mean, it's the same, it's the same hormone. It's just to get different doses, dosages, I guess. It, it's, I think that they, it will be, I think it will become available. Um, yes. In different kind of concentrations. I think it will. It's not like it's rocket science to make it. You know, okay. we can make it. It doesn't. It, it's just that there has to be. It has to be market. You know, there has to be a market for it. And unless doctors are prescribing it, then they won't. No one's. You know, no one's going to. Um, they won't manufacture it because it won't be worth it cost wise. Mm. So I think it's really it's, it's filtering down to doctors that it's okay to use. Um, and in fact, it can be massively beneficial. Um, and then then there will hopefully be that demand. So. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. But, it is criminal the testosterone thing i know because you're like that's 10 pounds and then the testosterone you have to really really you know pay through the roof for it's it's extortionate um but you know i just think you can't put a price on feeling better and unfortunately it's it's what we have to do it's honestly what we have to do and that's why speaking to you is so amazing because you've got so much information and you're really helping to clear up so many of these gray areas for me i had no idea that i was taking the effectively like it's almost like buying it on the street corner isn't it i feel terrible well it's, pro <laughs> it's, uh, it's probably well, not quite like that and I'm like sure you got you got estrogen got estrogen got any pedestrian got any testosterone so <laughs> trying to do a bargain on the corner it's 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 probably a bit better than that i know <laughs> but um but it is not you don't you the, the the concern is that you don't know what you're getting because it's because you know like everything in medicine is regulated you know doctors are regulated we have appraisals we have to pass exams we, we're inspected and yet why why you know those pharmacies aren't okay. that's the problem it's just so, so incongruent with everything else that we do in medicine. Everything we do is evidence-based and, you know, scrutinized and you can only do something if it's been proven. And, and yet this, that is a much more gray. So. Yeah. It's really surprising because I just thought in the, in this country, like, you know, it's like, Oh, it's not FDA approved or it's not this approved. I thought we, I thought we were really strict with what we could and couldn't sell or just dis or distribute to people. So I, I, I this, this is a real shock to me. So thank you for highlighting it and for educating us. Um, and thank That's you for nice. another amazing talk. Again, we've just literally scratched the surface. There's so much more. I'm sorry we didn't get around to answering all of your questions today, but we will um, we'll come back and do another one and we will get through the list of questions. Um, we have tackled some tonight. We've sort of did a sort yes. of overall rounded up some of the different themes in different areas. Um, but we will tackle some more uh, tricky ones next week. Um, but thank you so much, Naomi, for talking Brilliant. to us. Thank, thank you, you for me. watching. It was, it was as it should be, informative, educational, but we had a giggle as well at the same time. Yeah. Um, and I will add your details. I will post this on my main page. So if anybody needs to go back and refer to it, it's there. And um, Naomi's um, website and uh, handle, Instagram handle will be there. So you can book or go, you can pick her brains or book an appointment or do both, hopefully. Um, thank you though, sweetheart. It was really thank nice talking you. to you. Nice thank you so you. much. Take bye everyone. Bye. Take good care. Bye-bye. Have a nice evening. Bye. And you, bye.